So like, that's the thing too, is, you know, I just watched, I, I just recently rewatched um, the Ken Burns' documentary series in the Vietnam War. Um, but, uh, you know, there were a lot of young men on both sides, you know, the Vietnamese and the, the, uh, and the Americans, whose lives were completely ravaged by the war. Yep. You know? uh, there's a corporal who, in the American army, his name was John Musgrave. And he talks about how, even as a grown man, and he's in his 70s now, he sleeps with a nightlight um, because he can't be in the dark yeah. because of what he experienced in Vietnam. We talked earlier about like this system breeds sociopathy and like being crazy. Yeah. Um, I think war does that to people. I think it takes perfectly normal, healthy, kind, generous people and makes them monsters for yeah. the explicit purpose of uh, imperialism and domination. Hi and welcome to Red Reviews, the podcast where we talk about a variety of books with a Marxist and anarchist perspective. And I'm joined by my co-host, Justin Clark. Hi, Corey. How are you doing? Not too bad. Thanks for joining me. Thank you. Uh, and, and thank you for those who have been patient waiting for the new episode. Um, we weren't able to record last time because I didn't have any power at my house. I lost power for four days in January. Uh, it was awful. It was a whole ordeal. You can learn more about what horrors I experienced with that in the pregame if you're a patron. Um, right. To become a patron. Uh, and um, But uh, yeah, I'm back and I have a new camera and I'm figuring out the lighting and we're, we're doing as best we can here. It's working. It's a work in progress. It is absolutely a work in progress. You know, so if you're like, wow, he looks like crap. I'm sorry. I'm trying. <laughs> <laughs> you know. Uh, as it's I said fine. It's we, fine. I, but but yeah. So tonight, I think uh, this is going to be a really fun episode um, to kind of talk about. I think that in many respects, um, to sort of uh, quote Adam Johnson of the Citations Needed podcast, this one episode will be sort of a spiritual sequel to a previous episode we did. So um, we talked about Mutual Aid by Peter Kropotkin. Um, yep. And sort of thinking about evolution and through the lens of anarchism. Um, tonight, we're going to be viewing evolution through the lens of Marxism. Um, cool. And I think that the book is a good companion. The book we're going to talk about tonight is a good companion to Mutual Aid. Um, and this episode will be a good companion to that Mutual Aid episode. So tonight, nice. we're going to be talking about Marxism and Darwinism by Anton Panacek. Um, Anton Panacek... Um, Easily one of, I think, the most interesting Marxists of the 20th century. Um, he was a part of the sort of libertarian Marxist tradition of people like um, Rosa Luxemburg. Um, oh, okay. And like Kropotkin, he was also a scientist. I think he was like an astronomer. So he did okay. a lot of work on like astronomy. I guess he's written like a very like popular book on astronomy that it's like it doesn't have anything to do with his politics. It's just he's he's good at astronomy, right? Um, and but he's but he's somebody who has that sort of interesting intersection of politics and science, which I think for the skeptical leftist uh, and for red reviews, I think that's right up our alley. Yeah, that's um, good, is thinking good about that kind of stuff. Um, and Panacek is what you would consider a council communist. That was what he was. Okay. Um, and later in the year, we're going to do a book that's a collection of writings um, called Non-Leninist Marxism about the Council Communists, of which there will be an essay we'll review in that book from Panacek. Um, he okay. also has the famous book Workers' Councils, which we might do later on. Um, but his politics are, are certainly interesting and I think fairly close to my own um, in, in terms of critiquing, uh, I think, some of the, the more um, – sort of authoritarian and problematic aspects of Leninism and the, and the, and the, and the, the real limitations of limit of Leninism, um, which we'll talk about in a future episode when we do the Marcel Liebman book, which I've been um, getting through and, and uh, spoiler alert, I absolutely love this book, that book. And I can't okay. wait to do that episode, but we'll do right that in, in March. Um, so tonight we're going to start talking about Darwin and Marx. Um, okay. We are recording this uh, the day after Darwin's birthday. So Darwin was oh, born yeah. on February 12th, 1809, same day that Abraham Lincoln was born. 
Um, and I've always said that if you want to look at who might be the three most influential figures of the 19th century, I think the three are Karl Marx, Charles Darwin, and Abraham Lincoln. I, I, I think okay. that if you think if you think of the 19th century, of just yep. the white dudes, we're not talking about women or anything like that. Right. Not that there's anything wrong with that. I women are important too. You know, of course. I mean, I think in terms of the 19th century, like and we're talking about revolutionary women who were kind of incredible. We can certainly do that. But in terms of the guys, those three I think are rather important. And especially Darwin and Marx. Um, we know that Darwin was aware of Marx, um, having lived in mid to late 19th century right. London and in England, right? Uh, you know, um, or Jar Darwin actually lived sort of in a suburb of London, but went to London frequently. Um, and of course, Marx lived in London for most of his life as a, as a essentially refugee from his own country. Right. Um, so he, ha he was certainly aware of Marx and Marx was certainly aware of Darwin. There were letters of him writing to Ingalls and to others, um, about that and, uh, and about, uh, about Darwin and, I think that in many respects, um, they complement each other very well because both Marx and Darwin have um, an evolutionary way of looking at the world, right? So yeah. with Darwin, it's an ev it's evolution by means of natural selection in the natural world. So we're thinking about yeah. how evolution occurs in the natural world. With Marx, it's about evolution in the social world uh, of humanity. Yeah. Um, and so, uh, and so Panacek starts his book with this paragraph that I think is a good summation of what we've discussed so far, where, where he writes, two scientists can hardly be named who have in the second half of the 19th century dominated the human mind to a greater degree than Darwin and Marx. Their teachings revolutionized the conception that the great masses had about the world. For decades, their names have been on the tongues of everybody and their teachings have become the central point of the mental struggles, which accompany the social struggles of today. The cause of this lies primarily in the highly scientific contents of their, cheat, of their teachings. The scientific importance of Marxism, as well as of Darwinism, consists in the following and the following out the theory of evolution, the one upon the domain of the organic world of things animate, the other upon the domain of society. So there again, we really get this sense that, you know, Darwin completely revolutionized our conception of the world. Um, that, you know, up until Darwin, most people sort of believe that every animal that's been on the earth just kind of started the way that they were and that they were put there by God or providence or some kind of, you know, and there were some who had natural conceptions of it, people who were precur precursors, right? And you could certainly say that a lot of Darwin's ideas weren't necessarily original to him, and you could say the same thing about Marx, but what they both do, which is very important, is they are systematizers of all of the previous knowledge of both the natural world, sort of, you know, um, and the social world. Um, and so with that in mind, I think that it's very natural to put the two together. They are right. not antagonistic in the way that people would think they are. In, in many respects, I actually think they're rather complementary. Yeah. Yeah. It seems, seems natural to have, like you say, the, the evolution of, uh, on both sides of things. Yeah. Um, and, and that's, you know, and, and again, Darwin and Marx are products of the enlightenment, right? So the, the enlightenment, which is coinciding with the scientific revolution, you know, uh, you know, what Darwin is doing and what Marx is doing in the 19th century are great modernist projects. They're not postmodern, right? They're, they're modern right. projects. We're <laughs> systematizing literally. information. Yeah, yeah it's, they're literally. Um, they're systematizing ideas and concepts and coming up with grand unifying theories to connect them all. Yeah. With Darwin, it's evolution by means of natural selection. And with Marx, it's... Um, understanding of of the mechanics of capitalism precise specifically um really honing in on the nature of the labor theory of value um and the uh and the the mechanisms by which capitalism um, emerges so you know and I, and I think that that's all very very relevant because what 
what Darwin and Marx do is they demystify things for people. Mm-hmm. You know, so before it, before Darwin, like I said, people sort of thought that animals were sort of products of God or whatever. Right. But after Darwin, people may have believed in God, but God was irrelevant in, yeah. in the process of evolution. Yeah, they um, knew that, that these things happen through natural selection and through, yeah. yeah. Through purely natural processes. Now, maybe we don't necessarily know how it got started, you know, the concepts of abiogenesis. Maybe we don't know the very exact beginning of life, but, you sure. know, uh, with, with there's, even there's, rudimentary yeah. experiments like the Miller-Urey experiment over, you know, 40, 50 years ago, where you just put a few things in a vat and you electrify it and things happen. <laughs> you know, the developing of basic, you know, proteins and, and, um, and amino acids that kind of are the building blocks of life. Like you can, you can make this stuff. It's not that hard. Um, but, you know, what's interesting is that what Panacek does in the book is he helps us understand Darwin in the context of not just Marx, but in the context of um, dialectical materialism, in the sense that he analyzes the economic conditions in which Darwin grew up and emerged, and how those economic systems influenced his thoughts. And so he writes about this. He says, Darwin pondered this problem long before he found its solution in the struggle for existence. In this theory, we have a reflex of the productive system of the time in which Darwin lived, because it was the capitalist competitive struggle which served him as a picture for the struggle of existence prevailing in nature. Um, Yeah, right? So Darwin it was a product of the 19th century, the emergence of the capitalist system in Britain becoming fully dominant around the world, um, is seeing in it, in some respects, what Marx is seeing in it. Mm-hmm. Um, but the difference is, is that Darwin is seeing it in a more abstract sense and sort of the struggle for existence, whereas Marx is more explicit about, well, it's a struggle of existence between classes. Okay. And that class struggle element is very crucial. And so that's what kind of separates the two. Um, And so what we see with Darwin is the the real systematizing of this knowledge that had been built up by hundreds of years of people, whether it's Aristotle, Linnaeus, um, and even Malthus. I mean, Darwin has been very clear about Robert Malthus's influence on his work. Robert Malthus, the theologian and, and, and economist, um, who wrote his grand theory on population. Um, you, yeah. m- our listeners may have heard the word Malthusian before, right? Yeah. So basically, Malthus's idea was that there will never be enough food to feed everybody. That, mm. that the propensity for people to reproduce, or you know, or creatures to reproduce, will not be you know directly correlated to the amount of food that they can consume, and as a result, you will have people who will die off and the people who will die off will often be the weaker ones in that situation. Um, and, uh, yeah, I mean, in general, you know, that's a theory that, um, again, is very much influenced by that 19th century struggle for existence, the development of yeah. capitalism, right? Yeah. Like, yeah. like you say, like, cause it is, it does lack a class analysis, right? Like, <laughs> it's, Absolutely. It's like, it's like assuming that the people who die off are the weak ones instead of the ones that were, pushed into the the category that gets no resources you're absolutely right and you are anticipating how panacek responds to this stuff okay so um you know so we'll we'll get to that in a bit so we have um with with darwin we have the theory of of natural selection that that's one of the key things that um that's the central tenet of evolutionary theory and Darwin's influence with Marx. It's really that it's those, it's those class distinctions in the class struggle. Um, as Panacek writes, he writes, you know, Marx proved that these class distinctions were owing to the various functions. Each one played in the productive process. It is in the productive forces that classes have their origin. And it is this process which determines to what class one belongs. And so we're seeing here, again, a very natural process. Yeah. Because people often tend to mystify capitalism. 
sort of say, right. you know, oh, well, it's, you know, it's capitalism is this natural system of competition, this, that, and the other. When we really, yeah. in reality, what it truly is, is it's the private ownership of the means of production and the owning class having rule over the working class. And that those antagonisms lead to social change. Um, and yeah, so we see that, um, that we see like there's a, there's a, there's a very clear line of development. So very much like with Darwin, where you see, you have, you know, sort of, you have the, the rudimentary, um, molecules of, of, of amino acids and proteins developing into, you know, um, prokaryotic cells, eukaryotic cells into, you know, various different trees of life up into, up until human beings and others, right? Cause people think of it as like a straight line, whereas like evolution is more like a tree. It's like a very big tree. Yeah. We all kind of come from the big tree and, and the trunk of life. Um, Marx is doing the same thing where he's saying there's a very clear line of development here between, you know, you know, pr there's the sort of primitive communism or the primitive, you know, and then you have the development of, uh, the feudal systems, and then you have the development of capitalism, and then eventually, oh, ideally, hopefully, to socialism, and and, and right. to the, the 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 society beyond class distinctions, beyond um, the commodity form, beyond uh, the the need for profit. Um, the other thing that Marx shows us too is very much like Darwin: evolution is not a fixed process. You know what humanity, human beings, look like today may be fundamentally different from, you know, 50,000 years from now, right? Humans, right. as we've existed, as what we look like right now, you know, we've only really been around a couple hundred thousand years yeah. as we are, right? Yeah. And, uh, and all of us who are of European descent, you know, those who are white generally, we all have a little bit, a bit of Neanderthal DNA in us too. So there's this yeah. interesting crossbreeding, right? Which is always interesting because I was talking about this with my wife the other day about people who make arguments about racial purity and race science and bullshit like that. So <laughs> yeah. if you want to make the argument for racial purity, then the most pure races would be the Africans. Yep. Because they're the ones who were homo sapiens and they have 100% homo sapien DNA. None of them are mixed with, you know, some, you know, quote unquote, lowly races like Neanderthals. As we, the Europeans are. Right. And we all have DNA from Africa because that's where life originated. That's where <laughs> life originated. So you, so in many respects, the native Africans are the, in the logic of race science nonsense, right. which it's yeah. nonsense is all bullshit. But a good way to refute that nonsense is to say, well, by your own logic, then the purest races are the native Africans because they were never interbred with lesser, with yeah. lesser races. There's no like, such thing as a pure white race. That's nonsense. Yeah, <laughs> it's nonsense, right? There's no really no such thing as a pure African race, right? There's, no, that's it's right. so absurd, but it's, it's you taking that silly argument and taking it to its logical conclusion, yeah. you know, and, and making them, making them see how absolutely stupid it is Yeah, because it is stupid. It is very stupid. Um, um, I guess we have yeah. a few comments here. I just want to, uh, yeah, uh, some random geek is here. So uh, they said Darwin and Marx, two thinkers that the right wingers and reactionaries totally misunderstand a lot. Mm -hmm. Yep. And then uh, also Darwin, uh, Darwin would would have hated the social Darwinists, and I bet Marx would have his criticisms of a lot of Marxists, modern Marxists. Yes. Oh yeah. Yeah. And we'll get into that. So. Um, the social Darwinists, uh, do we have any other comments before I? Yes. Yes. Uh, Velkin, yeah. uh, re referring to Mal Malthus, uh, that guy left a out a lot of variables. <laughs> totally. Absolutely. <laughs> right. You know, and he's working in, you know, in, you know, early to mid 19th century where, you know, he doesn't have the kind of, yeah. he doesn't have the Dollar tools base that isn't people quite there. have, but he's also making assumptions. Like he's making yeah. primary assumptions and then making whatever evidence he has fit those basic assumptions. He's not questioning yeah. them. Right. Um, and uh, I think and that then, that's really problematic. Some random geek also said, we are all just hairless apes. Yes. Yes. When <laughs> yeah. people say it's, it's, it's not enough to say that we descended from apes. We're not, we didn't just descend from apes. We are apes. Yeah, we actually are. Yeah. We actually are apes. Like, and, um, 
I remember when I visited the Smithsonian Museum of Natural History in Washington, D.C. for the first time. It was about, it was about uh, 10 years ago now. And I remember going into the, uh, the, the evolution exhibit, which um, really stuck with me um, for a couple of reasons. One, all mammals from you know the, the blue whales all the way to us, all of them are descendants of this small um, shrew that lived about 65 million years ago that survived the dinosaurs. These small shrews, they look like little rats. Um, they burrowed and they hid in places. So they survived yeah. the, the, the catastrophic, um, you know, uh, meteorites that destroyed the dinosaurs, you know, uh, environment and destroyed the, their, their time on earth. In that exhibit, there's a, there's a, a great thing you can walk into. It's this big room. And when you walk into this big room, in the middle is this little tiny statue of this little shrew sitting in the middle. And all around are all of the hu all of the mammals, including humans, whose ancestry ties back to this little guy wow. who survived. And I think that's pretty powerful. The other one yeah. is the human evolution part where it has all the different skulls um, and all the different types of hominid skulls. So right. you see like, so you see Australopithecus afarensis, you see Lucy, and she's like three feet tall and she's not very big. Um, but then you see all these different skulls of all these different, you know, um, Homo naledi, you know, Homo erectus, all the different ones until you get to a Homo sapiens. She gets us. And the thing that Panacek says in his book is that not only do you see a lot of diversity in nature, there's a tremendous amount of conformity in nature too. Right. You know, nature takes the, the, the path of least resistance. Yeah. You know, I mean, yes, like, you know, we're all special, especially in our parents' eyes. But like we humans, we all kind of, for the most part, kind of look alike. We're not, we, there's not a huge variation amongst us, right? You know, and the very, but there yeah. is, right? There's a lot of di differentiation. But then in some respects, there's not. Like earlobes kind of look the same for everybody. Well, and, you know, everybody's got two eyes. You know, you know, everybody, you know, almost everybody's got two eyes. Almost everybody has two hands. Like, you know, like it's, you know, it's, it's, you know, most people have you know, certain hair in certain places. Like it's like, it's, there's a certain level of conformity because nature is yeah. easy like that. Yeah. Um, yeah. And there's no reason for evolution to have wiped that particular thing out. Right. Exactly. Yeah. There's no, and it makes no sense. You know, nature's going to take the path of least resistance. As I said. Yeah, it's not going to exactly. constantly reinvent the wheel. Why would it? Yeah, we have one more comment from Velkin okay. uh, 999. Race science people are basically pugs. <laughs> <laughs> That's funny. I mean, I always get the kick out of the memes of the people who say, like, the, we're the pure race, and it's like these hideous people who look like they're inbred or whatever. Um, and uh, yeah. yeah. Or, yeah, um, that's right. you know, it's, it's like, or I saw one recently that was like these very, very skinny almost stick like legs on a person and on their calves was tattooed like white power or white pride or something like that. Right. And it's like, man, those little skinny legs are going to buckle under the weight of all of that <laughs> weight under that sort of racial prejudice. Yeah, um, that's right. you know, and yeah, it's absurd. You know, race is a social construct. Yeah. It's not a biological one. Yeah. Now that's not to say that there's certain things that people of certain ethnicities experience, you know, for right. example, with African Americans and sickle cell anemia, like that's a, that's a yeah. thing Africans and people of African descent often deal with more than people of European descent. Yeah. But there's, that's not, uh, yeah. I think there was a thing I, I learned like a couple of years ago about, uh, um, yeah, about blood types and how certain blood types are more common among people with African descent and, than they are among people of European descent. And that's just a thing. Yeah, yeah, exactly, exactly. Um, and so, yeah, I mean, race science is nonsense. I, I, I think I have it on the schedule for next year, um, but we're gonna do, um, we're gonna do um, the Mismeasure of Man by Stephen Jay Gould, which okay. is like the book. It's the book that debunks all the race science bullshit. Nice. Um, it's rare in history that a book debunking race science is written before the race science book is where, and I'm specifically rev mentioning the bell curve, the yeah, Charles yeah. Murray book. Um, so it, there was a revised Sam Harris's edition. Favorite book. <laughs> Sam Harris's favorite book. Yeah. Because this is categorical. I mean, this is the one thing I will say 
I don't know if Sam Harris is the most racist of the four horsemen that may be Dawkins. It may um, be Dawkins. As, seeing as he was born in colonial Kenya, I don't know. Um, but he is ex- he's the most explicitly racist, I think, of the four horsemen. Um, oh, boy, I, I, yeah. <laughs> I think he really is. I mean, I think he's deeply racist. And not just like against black people, but I think against Arab people. And, um, well, and that's, know, that's, I mean, I guess not to get too far off a topic, but this mm-hmm. is exact coming out dramatically in, in the number of episodes that he puts out regarding like Israel and, and what's going on in Gaza right now. Oh my God. I can't imagine what absolute oh, he's, garbage. He's a, the he's sewage absolute is spewing trash. Him. Yeah. <laughs> just nothing, nothing of any value, just racism. <sighs> And I'll tell you what, I mean, we knew that some of that was coming when years ago he published an op-ed on his website of, it was why I don't criticize Israel. He said it flat out. Um, yeah, I think that, I, oh man, I hate Sam Harris so much. He's, <laughs> he's truly the worst. He sucks so bad. Although like the thing about him though, is as someone who has read, all of his books, and I have. I've not read the book that's basically his version of a Tim Ferriss book where it's just shit from his podcast. That doesn't count like a real book to me. Right. You know, right. An edited transcript of your podcast is not a book to me. Sorry. Um, uh, um, well, that ruins every- my future book. <laughs> <laughs> no, no. no, no, no. That's not to say that like you can't take things from your podcast and then make them into like text form and like add things to them. But literally right, right. his book is just transcripts of interviews he did with people. That's all it is. Ah, yeah. And I'm like, well, if you've listened to this, why would you read it? I mean, I, <laughs> you know, but anyway, uh, as someone who's read all of his books, you get kind of a world-class education and how to detect bullshit. Um, yeah. Because I have found that the people who are often the most irrational are the people who say that they're so rational. Um, yeah. I, I, I've talked about this before. I call it the cult of reason where, you know, they're just saying, well, I'm being reasonable. So therefore, blah, 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 blah. It's like, a, it's a, it's a, it's a sort of deflection from getting to the heart of the real issue where you can, you yeah. know, the, the logic bros. I mean, that's, it's, I mean, mind you, some of that is so 2014, but it's, I mean, it's, it's so past us now, yeah. but uh, I'm not, I'm not surprised in the slightest that, that he has been just spewing utter bile on his, tel- on his podcast. Yeah. His, his, his views haven't really adapted since 2014. Like he's still the same guy that he was nope. then. So, and that's the thing I have found fascinating about him and Dennett and all of these guys is that they just don't change. Nothing changes them. Nothing. You know, they don't change their mind on anything. They don't reconsider stuff. They don't entertain different ideas. They're nope. not, they're not doing critical thinking well. Um, you know, I mean, I mean, Daw- I mean, Dawkins himself is like the, he's like the turf du jour, right? Like it's, he is yep. the worst on that stuff. And it's really sad to think that the Center for Inquiry, which was founded by Paul Kurtz, one of my uh, influences and somebody, it's appalling that CFI uh, will back him on his anti-trans nonsense. Um, it it, yeah. it kind of breaks my heart. Um, But that's why I will never give CFI another dime of my money. I will never step foot in a CFI building. Um, I am only loosely affiliated with them because, um, full disclosure, the Truth Seeker magazine, which I'm a contributor to, is funded by a foundation that's run by CFI. But I don't – but, you know, I've never had to change anything I've said editorially because of that. But, you know, I'm not directly financially – connected to, to CFI. Um, I think that that CFI ever since the Dawkins merger has become crap and it, and it yeah. sucks. Um, yep. and it will only get better when, and it'll only improve when, um, when Dawkins dies, uh, it will only get better and it may not, who knows, but it will not get better. Uh, now. Yeah. 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 It definitely I, won't yet. Yeah. The, the skeptical community is a huge dumpster fire of which I want nothing to do with. Um, and it's yeah, essentially we've, we've, re- we've relitigated this numerous <laughs> times. So if you're hearing this for the umpteenth time, I'm sorry, but yeah, yeah, uh, these people suck, and we can move on. Um, <laughs> Sounds good. <laughs> so let's talk a little bit about the the, the social Darwinism stuff. Um, okay. So 
Panacek deals with this head on. So he makes the really good point that, you know, that uh, Darwin is certainly influenced by the competition that he sees in capitalism and sort of developing his theories of a natural selection. Mm. Um, and uh, it's no surprise that the bourgeoisie of the 19th century glommed onto it pretty quick because it, 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 it sort of reinforced and justified what they were doing. You know, right. so they could look at Darwin and say, well, see, look, the, you know, life is, a, is but a struggle in competition of the strong against the weak. And that's how yeah. capitalism is too. You don't um, fucking get it if that's what you're saying. <laughs> and so, you know, we see this really, um, uh, I think, messed up problem where, uh, where Darwinism is used as a means to justify the egregious nature of the egregious excesses of capitalism, especially 19th century. Yeah. Um, and, you know, so where does this social Darwinism come from? Wh where is this stuff coming from? Well, it really didn't come from Darwin explicitly. Um, in his life, right. Darwin, you know, whereas like Marx often once said, like, if this is, if this is who Marxists are, then I am not a Marxist. Like in a letter, I think he wrote to someone, Darwin did the same thing. He's like, I'm not a social Darwinist. That term was not coined by him. Survival yeah. of the fittest was not coined by him. Most of this yeah. goes back to a thinker of the 19th century named Herbert Spencer. Okay. Um, and Herbert Spencer, who was kind of a giant of 19th century philosophy and, and science, who and politics, who is largely sort of seen as a villain today, and in many respects, I think that's true. Um, and so, you know, he's the guy who comes up with the survival of the fittest. You know, he develops right. these theories of social evolution where, you know, which essentially justify things like um, getting rid of poor laws and, and helping people, you know, you know, just let them rot and die. Um, because they're right. the weak and we want the strong to survive in the race. Um, this is where you get eugenics. Eugenics is yeah. a direct outshoot of this. Um, and, the, and the guy who coined the term eugenics and sort of created the science as, we, as, as it developed science. I'm going to put that big scare quote. It's not science, <laughs> yeah. it's the pseudoscience. It's a pseudoscience. Um, fake science. Um, was Francis Galton, um, who was Charles Darwin's nephew. So Darwin is connected okay. to this stuff. And we can't ignore that. But Darwin right. in his lifetime, um, as I think Adrian Desmond has written, uh, Darwin was vehemently anti-slavery his entire life and, and saw the uses of sort of social Darwinism as a means to justify slavery or justify um, human misery. Um, he was very much against. And, um, yeah. and so I think that you know, Darwin was somebody who – kind of stayed above the phrase of politics slightly, but every person is a product of politics. Every person is a product of the conditions in which they grow up. So, yeah. Um, so I'm going to just quote Panacek here real quick to kind of sum up what we've been discussing in terms of Spencer and Darwin. So he says, we wish to remark here on how a small change of almost similar words serves as a defense of capitalism. Darwin spoke about the survival of the fittest and those that are best fitted to the conditions. Seeing that in this struggle, those that are better organized conquer the others, the conquerors were called the vigilant and later the best, quote unquote. This expression was coined by Herbert Spencer and thus winning on their field and thus winning on their field, the conquerors in the social struggle, the large capitalists were proclaimed the best people. Um, and so it's this sort of, it's this defense of individualism and capitalism and hierarchy. The divine right of kings based divine on- Divine right of kings. The false view of fucking uh, Darwinism or evolution. Yeah. It's a way of justifying what they're doing. Yeah. Um, and it's very similar to um, uh, the religion and the ways that 19th century capitalists would use religion and sort of morph Christianity to their purposes. Engels writes about this, I think, very eloquently in his um, one of his introductions to one of his pamphlets. I think it's socialism, uh, utopian, and scientific. And so, you know, what's what we're really seeing here is that there's a lot that's left out in the story of evolution. And what's really left out is something that we've talked about with um, with. Kropotkin. And in fact, Panacek mm. actually actually references um, Kropotkin and um, oh, okay. saying that one of the things that we learn is that 
uh, species are often sociable and that sociability or mutual aid, as Kropotkin called it, is a key element, a indispensable element to evolution. Not just natural evolution by means of natural selection in the Darwinian sense, but evolution in the social sense. Because yes, we, we can talk about the evils and horrors of capitalism of which there are, nu- are numerous, but capitalism is an objectively better system than feudalism is. There's right. a certain there's a certain element in which capitalism is much better. Um, that there's you know, and that socialism there's an there's sort of a, an evolutionary nature to it. That, that capitalism is can provide certain things to people um, in ways yeah. that e- prior economic systems could not. So he, so Kropotkin hits on something that's very, very important in the book, where he says, when a number of individuals live in a group, herd or flock, they carry on the struggle for existence in common against the outside world. Within such a group, the struggle for existence ceases. The animals which live socially no longer wage a struggle against each other, wherein the weak succumb, just the reverse. The weak enjoy the same advantages of the strong. So he's not saying exactly what terms they would use um, later on in the sort of evolution debates, especially the 1970s. But we're talking about group selection versus individual selection. So, and, you know, so what you're seeing is that within groups, there's a tremendous amount of sociability, that it's actually in people's self interest. To cooperate and be social with one another, right? Um, yep. This is where, if you, you know, this is where, with like, say, for with with um, wolves, for example, if you have a wolf that is a part of a tribe that is, you know, unhinged and doesn't go along with the social affections, they will that group will likely cast that one out for yep. lack of sociability, right? So, yep. in fact, that desire for competition actually leads to the death of an animal within a group. Now, there is still competition to a certain extent between different types of animals, as some animals eat others, and that's the food chain. But what we see is a a tremendous amount of sociability within animals. So this this debate is something that Panacek wrote about well over 100 years ago, which is still very much there today, which is the individual versus group selection. People who believe right. in the sort of individual selection or gene selection, those are people like Richard Dawkins, selfish gene, all that. Yeah. People who believed in group selection are people like David Sloan Wilson and uh, and um, uh, Stephen Jay Gould, um, who argued mm-hmm. that group selection is, is actually a, a huge key factor in evolution as well. And uh, I think that the evidence is, I think, shown that, that Gould and Wilson are right. Um, that, that, uh, you know, how could a species survive? It was, if it was constantly competing with itself. So, um, so yeah, so this is the thing that he sort of says, and he says, you know, the power meaning, you know, this power of, of sociability is, or the power of groups doing well is found in the social motives, the instinct that holds them together and causes the continuance of the group. Every animal must place the interest of the entire group above his own. It must always act instinctively for the advantage and maintenance of the group without consideration of itself. And we see this, right? We see this in people, right? Like, you know, uh, for example, this is when, you know, a, a firefighter will go into a burning building to save a child that's not his own. Yeah. yeah. Because it's, it's so, being sociability is good for, for, for the human race. Because, yep. And it's good for other races. Um, so, yeah. So, I think sociability is really, really important. Um, it's even – I would even say like it's it's the the virtue that is taken advantage of by nationalism when they like send soldiers to war to protect their country, right? They it's, Yes. It's the same – like they believe they're doing something honorable because of that sociability within species even though – they're being manipulated by powers that be, you know, but it's the same, same idea. It's the same logic. You're right. It's the same logic that exists in, um, you know, with sports and in yep. competitions. Right. So, you know, within the group, you know, it's like, you know, let's, let's say the Super Bowl just happened. You know, if, if the Kansas city chiefs, <laughs> you know, who won the Super Bowl, 
Uh, yeah, did you know there was a sports ball thing that happened? <laughs> the Kansas City Chiefs, who who just won the Super Bowl, like they couldn't have won the Super Bowl if like Travis Kelsey was like beating up one of his you know his teammates, right? Like, right. They're yeah. working in concert together. Yeah. In competing against another team, it was also working in concert together, right? So yeah. they're competing against each other, but they're not competing within the groups. That's right. So it's it's you know you can see it even in in social attitudes. Um, yep. In regards to sports, so you know what we see here is that um, that in the animal world, this is uh, I guess, again. Oh yeah, we got comments. We can stop. Yeah, we got a couple comments. I would. Uh, okay. I was just going to say, Velkin, uh, Velkin nine 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 said, Darwinism plus capitalism is like what if we took the struggle that had to take place to reach this potential ut- utopia and repeated it when we have abundant resources, but with monopoly money. <laughs> yeah, it's true. Yeah. Um, yeah. I think one of the most incisive then, critics on this. Oh, yeah. I was just going to say one of the most incisive critics on um, like like the sort of social like the social Darwinist components is Thomas Frank, um, the sort okay. of God of the market stuff. Yeah. And then uh, some random geek said uh, Emma Golden, uh, probably Goldman, even yeah. has an essay on how patriotism is weaponized for army recruitment and such. Absolutely. Absolutely. Then, don't you want to defend your country? Yeah. Yes. This is exactly right. Right. So you're seeing that all of the elements which are good in people, that sociability, that connectedness, the affability, mutual aid, kindness, altruism, all those things that humans are capable of um, get used for selfish ends. Yeah. And, and it's how... Um, you know, that's why when people say, oh, well, it's natural for humans to war against each other. And I'm like, maybe, but like <laughs> the fact that the fact that so many people who go to war have PTSD. We um, will never know if it's natural as long as there's people who have power over us manipulating us into doing it. And it's in their self-interest too, right? Yeah. So like, that's the thing too, is, you know, I just watched, I, I just recently rewatched, um, the Ken Burns' documentary series on the Vietnam War. Um, okay. And we're going to do an episode later in the year about the Vietnam War because it's on my mind a lot recently. Um, but, uh, you know, there were a lot of young men on both sides, you know, the Vietnamese and the, the, uh, and the Americans, whose lives were completely ravaged by the war. You know, yep. you know. Uh, there's a corporal who in the American army, his name is John Musgrave. And he talks about how even as a grown man, and he's in his seventies now, he sleeps with a nightlight um, because he can't be in the dark yeah. because of what he experienced in Vietnam. And yeah. you take, you, and it, we talked earlier about like this system breeds sociopathy and like being crazy. Yeah. Um, I think war does that to people. I think it takes perfectly normal, healthy, kind, generous people and makes them monsters. For yeah. the explicit purpose of uh, imperialism and domination, um, you know, and so yeah, I think that war is, you know, I think you're right. You know, it's it's never really been tried whether or not war is actually natural. My hunch is that it isn't, or at the very least, it's not in the way that we do it on the big scale. No, yeah. Uh, okay, two more. <laughs> okay, Belkin nine 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 patriotism, the mind killer. Yes, yeah, absolutely, absolutely. Um, another good book on this. On big, another good book on that is "Super Patriotism" by Michael, Michael Perenni. Okay, if you want to kind cool. of explore that more. And then uh, some random geek also said, "I hate the natural argument." Anyway, is it natural for men to want to have sex with women and get excuse used to excuse terrible acts? "Quote unquote." What was she wearing? Sort of thing. Yeah. No, I think you're absolutely right. I think you're yeah. absolutely right. So that is called the naturalistic fallacy. And yeah. um, that, that just because things are this way, that somehow it was natural. Um, one of the biggest perpetuators of the naturalistic fallacy is Jordan Peterson um, with his yep. whole lobster bullshit, right? They're like yeah. lobsters have hierarchies. So like people should have hierarchies. Like first off, lobsters are sea bugs. They're like fundamentally <laughs> different than us, right? Yeah, because right. it's not like they're coming out of the ocean like Dr. Zoidberg and talking. You know what no. I mean? You know? Yeah. They're not they're not We've coming in and being like, past that. <laughs> it's just absurd, right? And um and so uh yeah, I just think that's really crazy. 
Um, and it really, and it every, also, yeah. I was just going to say every single natural example, like example they use in nature to dictate hierarchical behavior in humans is actually like a misunderstanding of that frigging thing, right? Like the whole yeah, alpha I, wolf thing. That's not a yes, real thing. Yep. <laughs> they don't, that's they misunderstand the way that apes behave, you know, <laughs> based on resources, resources that are available. Like they just, everything they yeah. say is wrong. And if you're somebody who has grown up your entire life and has never questioned anything of like basic assumptions, because I think that's one yeah. of the key things of being on the left is like constantly questioning base assumptions of thinking through those things deeply um, yeah. is um, and being a critical thinker is like challenging and questioning capitalism, challenging and questioning hierarchy, challenging and questioning the this quote unquote natural order of things. Right. Because yeah. there isn't a natural order. Right. Um, I saw the Internet was um, absolutely incensed with itself that there's this new movie, uh, I think, about Alexander the Great. And in the first few, I think in the first like 10 minutes, he like he, he, he's intimate with another man. Yeah, and he, someone's like, yeah. "Oh, the woke agenda <laughs> has gotten to Alexander the Great," and here I am, you know, like learned student history, of history guy. <laughs> it's like, yeah, noted heterosexual Alexander the Great. Um, <laughs> it's just so odd. It's just, you know, that th if you actually go yeah. back to the ancient Greeks and Romans, they were far more comfortable, far more comfortable with homosexuality than we are. Yeah, uh, and, and and again, I would say a lot of that stems from you know, Puritan Christian morality. Yep. yep. Uh, and so, yeah, yeah. It's this, this idea that, Oh, well, it's natural for a man and a woman to be together. Well, if the natural end result is having a child, then, then you can make the argument that maybe that is, but what if the, the what if the result of two people being intimate with one another is just the pleasure of the act itself, which can be, which is yep. just as natural as the child that might be created from two people who conceive a child. But that's a sin, dude. It's a sin, bro. Um, you know, uh, yeah. Um, I, I, you know, Gore Vidal once said something about this. He, you know, he said that um, it's just as natural for someone to be a homosexual. It is for them to be heterosexual. Um, seeing if someone is a homosexual or heterosexual is about the same. It's about the same difference of someone who has blue eyes and someone who has green eyes. Yeah. And, 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 uh, and um, the, the, the person who he was being interviewed by pushed back and was like, well, who says that? And, who says so? And, and, and Corvidal was such a badass. He just goes, I say so. And it's like, you know, cause he saw it as being self-evident. He saw it as a self-evident yeah. truth that sexuality was on a spectrum and to, to speak of yourself as solely heterosexual or to speak of yourself as solely homosexual was kind of absurd because most people yeah. are somewhere in the middle. Yeah. Um, and yeah, yep, for sure. Lean one way or the other, but, yeah, lean one way or the other, but in general, one hundred percent. Yeah, I don't think there's any. I don't think there's a, such a thing. I, I don't. Yeah, and I think I there are proclivities either. certainly, but we all know that, like you know, that uh, that yeah, I think being homosexual is 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 very natural. I don't think it's yep, unnatural sure. at all. Um, and E.O. Wilson's written about this, the great biologist. He's talking about there's gay stuff going on in the animal kingdom all the oh, time, yeah. all For the sure. time. We got gay lions. We got gay penguins. We got, I mean, it's doesn't, you know what I mean? Like, it's so absurd to think that, that, uh, that, um, you know, that, uh, that, that the animal kingdom cares about our Puritan Christian morality. Yeah. You know, which is deeply unnatural. I mean, it's, you know, Christian ethics in a lot of ways are deeply unnatural, especially on the nature of sex. Yeah. Um, you know, uh, but, uh, but yeah. So in the latter part of the book, they, right. He talks a lot about the importance of how did humans become who they were? And this is really where he's very influenced by um, Friedrich Engels. Uh, and Friedrich Engels wrote a short section. Uh, we got another comment. We can do that real quick. Yeah, it's just, it's just it. some random geek. I'm sick of the chemicals in the water turning the freaking frogs gay. Uh, yeah, I couldn't That's do my amazing. Alex Jones voice, but, <laughs> but it, it made me laugh. So that is pretty amazing. I'm going to see if I can find this real quick. Yeah. I don't like them putting chemicals in the water. To turn the friggin' <laughs> frogs gay. My favorite yeah. thing about that, and this is something that uh, in 
I, I, you know, I'm a big John Oliver fan. He did a video on Alex Jones a few years ago, but all of that crazy shit that he says, like that Alex Jones says about the, the gay, the water and the, it's a gay bomb baby and all this kind of crazy shit. The reason he's saying all of that is because he's like hawking a, a water purifier that he sells on his website. <laughs> It's basically an unhinged ad for a Brita filter that he sells. That doesn't surprise me one bit. He's he's uh, such a yeah dishonest actor. Like he really is. He's such a huckster. Um, so Friedrich Engels wrote something in night in in uh, 1876 called "The Part Played by Labor in the Transition from Ape to Man," and okay. I think it was very influential on Panacek's conceptions. He doesn't like quote Engels directly from this. But Engels has this idea that one of the things that made humans different was our ability to use self-created and directed tools. So there are animals in the animal kingdom that use tools, you know, like if you look at other apes or look at other animals, but they don't purposely like make them. So like you'll see an ape will find a stick, use the stick to get into an ant sort of an ant hill and then eat the ants off the stick, right? But he didn't right. make the stick. He didn't make right. a device. Humans are kind of unique in that we can develop our own tools. Right. So uh, Panacek writes about this. He, he talks that, um, you know, that the way in which tools are developed are inherently soci- sociable, that, you know, tools in and of themselves are sociable. You know, for example, you and I are, are speaking through language. That is a tool right. which means nothing to one individual person, but yeah. it means everything to the way that you converse with someone else yeah. or even converse with your own mind. You know, I mean, I think most people think in language. They don't, you know, or they think in pictures and those pictures are then referenced translated, into language. Yeah. They're translated yeah. into language. Um, and so, you know, he talks about how, you know, Knowledge in the use of tools is not born with man, but is acquired later. Mental tradition, such as it is only possible in society, is therefore necessary. So from the very beginning, Homo sapiens are a sociable species. We develop means of communication through language. Now, do do other animals have languages? For sure. Like like whales sure. can converse with one another, dolphins, you know, yep. but but they're just sort of letting out, you know, sort of, you know sort of cries or guttural sounds or whatever, right? But there's not a systemization to it in the way that there is with human language. They don't have a set of rules that they're like, no, you said that wrong. Yeah, exactly. (laughs) The pronunciation is off. (laughs) There's not now, there are no nouns, verbs. There's no independent clauses, dependent clauses. There's no past tense, present tense. None of that exists, but it does exist for, for, for human languages. Um, the fact that we can create things like axes and knives um, and guns um, or yeah. things like wheels and gears yep. and pulleys and levers. All of these are things the animal kingdom can't do, but we can. And why do we do them? We do them because they're in our benefit to do so within a system of social functioning, that we are yep. within a society. Right, a lot of these tools would be pointless if it was just like one person living off. We live in a society. We live in a society, right? <laughs> um, uh, and there's a great quote that he says about language, where he writes, "Language <laughs> is the body of the mind, the material by which all human science can be built up." And language, and, yeah. and language can be more than just like English or Spanish or French. For but sure. Language is also mathematics. Yep. Mathematics is a language, right? So we so right away, language is probably the most important tool the humans have ever come up with, you know. Yeah. It, and so, you know, so he so tools become a very integral part. This is straight out of Engels. So Engels is reading a lot of the evolutionary writings at the time, and he writes this transition of ape to man through labor. Um, okay, and he talks about how through acts of labor using tools humans developed the capacity for abstract thought because in abstract thought, it was able to expand the ability to use tools. Mm-hmm. And, and so we evolved to have those capacities precisely because we were animals that were so um, dependent upon sociability. You know, there are a lot of animals like giraffes or horses, like as soon as they come out of the mother's womb, within a few minutes, they can stand up and walk. 
Yeah. Within a few minutes, they can run. Yeah. Right. Humans, you know, humans don't really become fully fledged members of the human family until they're what, 18 years old? You know, at the minimum, <laughs> yeah. 25 at the most. We know that the human brain continues yeah. to develop until 25. Yeah. That's right. um, and so uh, humans they can't, require all of that. They can't walk for the first year, <laughs> usually. Exactly. So that's, that's a pretty long time to not be able to move around on your own. Yeah. It's a, yeah. You're not moving around. You're not being able to speak. You're not being able to do any, you know? And so, uh, and so we not only have the ability to create tools, we also have, uh, methods by which we use tools and we sort of have ways of discerning which tools to use when. Um, and so, yeah, I, I mean, and all of this grows the mental capacity of humans. So right away, we're seeing in the evolutionary process, not just of the natural evolutionary processes of Darwin, but of the social evolutionary processes of Marx, we're seeing that social sociability and the ability to work together creates the conditions by which humans can improve themselves and the broader societies in which they live. Uh, and so I think that's very, very important. And, you know, and it's very different than what animals in the rest of the world really have. Um, I'm, I'm sorry. I got it. <laughs> no, you're good. Velka991. <laughs> uh, uh, can confirm. I just had a kid and the thing is pretty useless so far. Can't even pick up a hammer. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. Right. I mean, you know, yeah. they can't really grab much. They can't really do anything. Right. Yeah. You know? Uh, yeah. It's interesting. And so like, you know, if, if we were constantly in competition with one another, the, the babies that were being born of humans would never survive. Yeah. You know? Right. Uh, but yeah. So. Well, and, and I mean, not to get too out of, out of our wheelhouse here, but like, yeah, we know that like young, there's been various types of communities where raising of children was a full on community thing. It wasn't Absolutely. just like individual yep. households, nuclear families, the way we do it now. Like, it's so isolating and in and individualized now where, where like, yeah, it, it, for many different communities, it was a community thing. So. Exactly. Exactly. And so he ends his pamphlet with a chapter sort of broadly talking about capitalism and socialism. And he talks about how um, the capitalism has these sort of conditions of war of all against all. Mm -hmm. And, but as we learn from Marxism, right, that the, the conditions of the new were born out of the conditions of the old, you know, the only way, the only way to get to it is through it. Yep. Um, you know, that's what it means to overcome capitalism. It doesn't mean just like kind of just doing a skip over it. It's working through it. Yeah. And so, uh, he ends with writing, um, that the, organizational tools that were required of capitalism were also the tools that could lead to its possible undoing. Um, mm -hmm. The centralization of production, the development of planning, and ultimately the development of class consciousness. When you put different classes against one another, it is within the interest of those classes to unite, yeah. um, to fight for their interests. And yeah, so sure. if the bourgeois can do it, then the proletarians can too. Yep. Um, and he writes, the solid, this solid organization, meaning the organization of the working class, gives to the working class that, that great strength, which it needs in order to conquer the capitalist class. The class struggle, which is not a struggle with tools, but for the possession of tools, a struggle for the right to direct industry will be determined by the strength of the class organization. As before, under capitalism, the inferior machine will be outdistanced and brushed aside by the one that is superior. This actually gets to a point that you said earlier, which is that um, we were talking about earlier, which is like, oh, there wouldn't be any innovation under socialism. Um, right. And Panacek takes this head on and he says, um, let us now look at the future system of production as carried on under socialism. The struggle leading to the perfection of the tools does not cease. As before, under capitalism, the inferior machine will be outdistanced and brushed aside by the one that is superior. As before, this process will lead to greater productivity of labor. 
But private property having been abolished, there will no longer be a man behind each machine calling it his own and sharing its fate. Machines will be common property, and the displacement of the less developed by the better developed machinery will be carried out upon careful consideration. Um, I mean, it's right there, right? So innovation, efficiency, these are all things that like would happen under socialism. Yep. Not only because it it makes the system work better as a whole for everyone, but it's also in people's self-interest to do that. Yeah. You know, it's not in your self-interest to keep old machines that don't work well when you can replace them with better machines that work better. Right. Um, and so here we get in the end, the last, you know, couple of sentences is really, you know, this is written in the early 20th century, but it has a lot of that sort of 19th century scientific optimism rolled ill into it. Right. So this is before the atomic bomb. This is before the Holocaust. Right. This is before the horrors that science would rot in the 20th century. So just keep all that in mind when I read this. But he ends okay. it with, nature is subject to man, and with very little exertion from his side, she supplies him with abundance. Here, a new career opens for man. Man's rising from the animal world and carrying on his struggle for existence by the use of tools ceases, and a new chapter of human history begins. And so this is the nature of socialism, right? That this is something straight out of Marx too, Marx and Engels, that, yeah. that with the development of socialism, um, there will be a new, the real human story actually begins. That what we're living in now is in many respects, a very prolonged, uh, uh, an elongated um, prehistory um, yeah. that uh, will only be, transferred into the beginnings of real human history with the development of socialism. Um, yeah. And so, uh, so that in a nutshell is Darwinism and Marxism by Anton Penichek, a great little book, uh, you know, more of a pamphlet than a book, but I think indispensable in thinking about how Darwin in many respects is not a refutation of Marx and Marx is not a refutation of Darwin yeah. in good dialectical fashion. They interact with one another. Yeah. connecting together and interacting with one another and helping us understand ourselves and the world that we live in. Yep. I like that. All right. Well, what are we covering next time? So next time um, we are going to be doing, I'm very excited about this. Um, we're going to be doing the book Red Valkyries by Kristen Godsey. Okay. Um, it is going to be a book about five revolutionary women um, so we're going to be doing women's history and we're going to be talking about um, women who were from the Soviet Union and Bulgaria and Eastern Europe who uh, in many ways created a proletarian feminism that is a heritage that we should be very proud of and learn from. So right that's on. what we'll be doing next time. Awesome. And that leaves, where can people find you? So you can find me at justinclark.org. That's the website right down here. Um, that's where you can find all my writing. You can find all of the uh, episodes of the podcast there. Um, and uh, I will be working on a new article for The Truth Seeker that will be out probably in the spring, where I'm going to be doing sort of an assessment of Stephen Jay Gould's idea of non-overlapping magisteria in relation to religion and science. Okay. Um, his book, where he outlines that idea, Rocks of Ages, is going to be 25 years old this year. Um, so I'm going to kind of go back and think through that. And I believe, uh, uh, because I believe in knocking out two birds with one stone, we'll also be talking about that book on the podcast too. Um, nice. and so, and so the last thing I will say as well is, oh, two things. Um, you can also follow me on social media. Uh, I'm at Justin Clark PH. PH stands for public history. I am on Instagram, threads, blue sky and TikTok. back on TikTok. Um, definitely check out some of our clips that we've been putting out that uh, yep. Corey's been working hard on getting out of all the, from, from our conversations. I think they're really interesting clips there than, than they're, and uh, they're really fun to review. And, and uh, honestly, you make so many of them, it's hard to keep track sometimes. Uh, but and I've been trying to repost them on my own pages, but sometimes it's hard. I'm like, by the time I'm going to post one, I was like, Oh, there's another one. I'm like, Oh my God. I'm back Yeah. Off. It's got a scheduling tool and, <laughs> but it doesn't have a calendar to show you when you scheduled them. So then I'm like oh. trying to keep track of everything. And okay. you know, sometimes they post when I didn't plan for it. And yeah. Oh, okay. Okay. And as always, please consider becoming a patron um, at, was it patreon.com forward slash skeptical leftist or the skeptical yep. leftist skeptical. Leftist. Um, you know, 
uh, you know, Corey works very, very hard um, for this show and all of his great interview episodes. He's brought back um, his podcast series with your partner, um, which is very exciting, I think. Uh, so there have been some clips of that, too. Yep. Um, and so, yeah, definitely become a patron, you know, uh, help this guy uh, continue to do the great work that we're all doing here. Much appreciated. Thank you to everyone for joining us tonight and uh, have a good one. Thanks. All right. That's all, folks. Thanks for watching or listening. Remember to share this show with your friends and on the social media site that you use the most. Thank you to everyone who share, supports this show on Patreon. I really appreciate it. And it helps me keep the internet and the power on. Thanks to my top patrons, Some Random Geek, Damien Marie at Hope, Justin Clark, Dan F. Smith, and Lisa Glass. And thank you to all my new patrons. You can stay tuned for the list of the patrons at the end to see your name listed. If you aren't a Patreon and want to contribute to that, you can do that at patreon.com slash skeptical leftist, or you can send a one-time donation to buymeacoffee.com slash skeptical lefty. I also have a sub stack where you can subscribe for free, or you can donate once donate per month. And lastly, you can get a paid subscription on Spotify that will give you the same access to bonus content and extra long episodes that is on Patreon. If you can't contribute financially, then a like on YouTube or five-star rating and a review on Apple Podcasts or one of the podcast review sites like Podchaser would be great. If you want to find more from me, then make sure to check the show notes for links to all my stuff and check out my website, skepticalleftist.com. That's where you can find all my social media spaces and communities. You can also email me at mindofaskepticalleftist at gmail.com. Thanks so much for listening and watching. Uh, make sure to leave a comment on the video or on my website, join your local org, print off some pa posters or pamphlets, and spread the propaganda. Also, stick around for a clip from this episode's post-show chat. United States made a very clear decision to, instead of being a democratic republic in service of the people, it yeah. became a fucking empire. Yeah. And it's destroying itself from within because it's an empire. Yeah. And in order for the republic to thrive, the empire has to die. And, and it will not die easily, yeah. but it will die.